Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Schmidt, and I'd like to welcome you back to genetics. This whole section, we've been talking about, as you can see, mutations and the nature of the gene. We're trying to really get at what a gene is. And if you're following along in order, in the last session, we focused mostly on the function of a gene in the sense that we know that one gene is responsible for making one enzyme or one protein. Certainly, we've said things about the structure of the gene in the past, but we really want to get at it. We're pinpointing it more and more and more. And in this session, we're going to use mapping of viral genes, fine structure mapping, in order to really elucidate what a gene is from a structural point of view. If this seems, I mean, I know you guys know structure and function really are inseparable. One determines the other, one demands the other. So if you're a little hazy on, you know, where we're going right now, I promise I can promise as much as I can that it will come clear very shortly. So the first thing we need to talk about in order to do this is just the general idea of mapping viral or, in this case, phage genes. In case, I, I think we've said it before, but a bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. They're reasonably easy to work with because you can do it all in culture in the lab. And there are many reasons you might want to map it. Uh, sometimes you just want to map it to get the map. But in this case, we're going towards a structural definition of the gene. So first of all, the whole idea of mapping, we've done it so many times in so many different concepts. I say here, it's based on the same the same way that we've always done it, which is looking for recombinants and figuring out you know, based on the percentage of recombinants, how far apart two loci are. Uh, I say here, just sort of like we did with flies or whatever we did it with. But with phages, uh, we have to be a little bit more clever about it. How could one even know phages are there? I mean, you can only see them with an electron microscope. We're not going to use that. What we basically do to, quote, grow phages is to use a so-called lawn, a lawn of bacteria just means heavy growth. Sometimes it's called confluent growth. They call it a lawn because you could think of just a nice uh, lush grass, unlike the one outside of my house, but regardless. So you have this lawn of bacteria, and when phages are growing there, what they're really doing is destroying the bacteria. In fact, bacteriophage means bacteria eater. They don't really eat them, but they do destroy them. So you get these so-called plaques. What a plaque is, is a clear area on the lawn where the bacteria have been killed, so they're no longer there. You can literally see a hole on the lawn. So that's the way that we can detect them. Now, certainly viruses don't have sexual reproduction, uh, which is usually demanded for this type of mapping, right? But we can, in a very real sense, cross phages of two different genotypes by doing a process called co-infection. All co-infection means is this bacterial cell that's going to be attacked, we're going to put phages of two different types in there. And if the phage DNA that's of one type gets in that cell, and then we have phage DNA of another type, they can both get into that cell. And the two DNAs can co-mingle and crossing over can occur. It's not sex, but it's simulating that type of a situation, at least in the sense that you have two chromosomes, if you want to call them that, that are in a position to exchange parts and to undergo crossing over. So co-infection, it's good to know that term. You're infecting the same bacterium with phages of different genotypes. And as I just said, once inside the cell, meaning once the DNA goes into the cell, crossing over can occur between viral genomes. So let's look at an example of that so we get used to doing it. Phage mutants, uh, bacteriophage T2 is a very famous one that a lot of work has been done with. The T-even phages, T2, T4, etc., are among the most widely studied. So here's a situation where we're going to look at two different loci, two genes of the virus. One's called H and one's called R. Now, the wild type for H, um, this has to do with, and don't worry about why, um, there are many, many strains of E. coli, but 
The wild type can only infect this strain called strain B, all right? But this H minus mutant can infect not only strain B, but what's called B slash 2, all right? So that's the difference between the wild type and the H minus mutant. R is another locus, and the wild type for R, uh, small fuzzy plaques are produced, and R minus is a mutant, produces large distinct plaques. Again, for right now, you don't have to worry about why. But the point is, while these are not traits like eye color and things like that, these are things that you can detect if you're looking at bacterial growth. You can see which strain gets infected, and you can see the type of plaque that comes about. All right? So let's take a look at a cross. I know it may sound odd, but we really are sort of crossing two viruses. So one is H minus R plus, one's H plus R minus. And you can go back and look and see what, if, in other words, if you just did a, if you infected bacteria just with that, it would have the wild type trait for R and the mutant for H. Uh, the opposite if you did a single infection with that one. But we're doing a co-infection, so DNA of both these types are going to be around. So how you do it, you co-infect bacteria, and you do it at what's called a high MOI. And MOI stands for multiplicity of infection. It just means you're putting so many viral particles in there that there's no uh, doubt that a good amount of all the types, in this case both types, are going to get inside. Now, this term lysate just means where you see the plaque, it looks like there's nothing there, but in fact there are viral uh I almost said viral cells. That would be a no-no. There are viral particles there, right? So the lysate just means you're collecting liquid in that area. Lysate is the place where the bacteria were lysed. So we know that there are going to be phage progeny there. And some of which, we're assuming, are going to be recombinant because crossing over has occurred. Then check out, this is so clever what we can do. Plate the lysate onto another lawn, but it's going to be a mixture of strain B and that strain B over 2. And on that type of a lawn, four plaque phenotypes are going to appear. So the two parentals, uh, if you just did a single infection, this is the way they would look. So H minus R plus. Now this is, <laughs> stick with me on this. I think it'll make sense. Small and distinct. Why is it small and distinct? Well, the R plus, remember, if we go back just for a second, R plus means small uh, plaques, and that's what we're getting here. So the small plaques come from the R plus. The H minus, they're distinct because this is a mixture of the two strains of E. coli. H minus can grow on both of those strains, can infect both of those strains. So all the bacteria are getting killed in a particular area. That's what we mean by distinct, not cloudy. You really see a plaque there. The other parental, H plus R minus, the R minus is responsible for the large size of the plaque, but also if it's H plus, what we mean by cloudy here, the reason it's cloudy is because on this lawn, the wild type with respect to H+, plus, let's just go back and look. H+, plus can infect strain B only. So if you do this correctly, and there's, think of a lawn, I don't know, with two different grass types on there. Only one of them is it being killed here. So even if there's full death of all the strain B, you've only thinned out the bacteria by a half. So you see the plaque, but it looks cloudy because there is still some growth there because only one of the strains was able to get killed. All right, so you can see a small and distinct plaque and a large and cloudy plaque. Know that those are parentals. If you're looking for recombinants, you could predict what they would be because H plus R plus would be one recombinant and H minus R minus would be the other recombinant, right? And generally speaking, when one's created, the other will be created as well. And you can just sort of mix and match. Uh, if it's H plus R plus, plus excuse me, that's fully wild type, which means small and cloudy, right? If it's fully...